day four of blockchain week 2023 and we have just returned from a short break and I'm really excited about this particular session and just full disclosure to everyone who's watching I re it was my decision I was desperate to hear one of these deep dark and exciting stories about what happens in I guess the the underbelly of the internet or the dark alleys of crypto crime and financial crime and the policing perspective and the forensic accounting perspective. So without further ado, I, I may have built that up a little bit too much. Sorry, Mark and Graham, I'm sure it's going to um, be absolutely wonderful. We are joined by Mark Bailey, Director of Corporate Finance and Forensic at Paul and Chadwick. At Hall, Hall Chadwick, is it? Hall, yeah. Hall Chadwick, correct. And Graham Keys, Queensland Police Detective and Chainalysis Training Specialist. Thank you so much for joining us today, gentlemen. I will give you the stage and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, and well, welcome everyone to this session on Chasing Digital Shadows. Uh, if people aren't aware, cha Chainalysis is I think without doubt, a world leader in uh, blockchain analysis. I started in 2014 and now have 900 people working for them around the world. And our, our guest today, Graham Pierce, uh, has a background that you certainly would not come across every day. So uh, Graham, could you provide a bit of uh, background for people listening in on, on your experiences? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so uh, I only joined Chainalysis last year. Um, prior to that, I spent the last 20 years as a, as a police officer in the Queensland Police, which for anyone who's not familiar with Australia is a state police agency here in Australia. Um, for the last sort of 14 years of that, um, so starting in about 2008, um, I was a specialist detective in a range of different units around the QPS, primarily in the online child abuse space and the Argos unit at, at Queensland Police. Um, the uh, online counterterrorism unit that was uh, stood up as part of a joint um, counterterrorism task force between the state police, federal police and other federal agencies um, and also at cybercrime. So um, basically I've spent the last 14 years um, bluntly being a bit of a nerd um, focused on some form of online cybercrime. Um, my speciality in that space was primarily around darknet investigations. So um, you know, identifying darknet users, taking over running Tor Hidden Services, uh, de-anonymizing darknet users, that sort of thing from an investigative capacity, um, using a range of different techniques, including controlled operations and, and other things. So um, I've been very lucky to have a great career in that space. Um, I've done a lot of teaching of other law enforcement in that space throughout my career in that time. I've traveled to Europe and Singapore and the United States on several occasions to to guest lecture around that as well. So you can see anyone who's sort of familiar with that space from a crime perspective knows that uh, cryptocurrency plays very heavily into that. Um, and so that's how I first came across crypto way back when. Thanks, Graham. Um, can, can I start this, the session first by just acknowledging the victims of the scams? Um, they're not, um, you know, that these are real, real people, and um, and you know, the, some of the stories that we've come across, and the quantum of financial loss, and the impact on those people, and and their extended families is um, really it's devastating. And um, so, really, uh, reach out to people that have um, been victims of of the scams. So the, the, the topic today is called digital shadows, um, but, but I'd like to change that to chasing digital fingerprints, because of course, with the blockchain, uh, there are fingerprints that can, can be followed. Um, just as a quick overview, Chain Analysis pr produced a, a fantastic report on illicit activity on the blockchain. And in 2022, they reported $20 billion in illicit activity, which was an increase on the year before, which sounds pretty bad. 0.24% uh, of the total value of transactions. 
However, you put it in the context of uh, a form, uh, sorry, a Forbes report um, pr produced by the UN, which es estimates two to 5% of global GDP is illicit activity. And uh, I'm, I'm sure people that have attended Blockchain Australia Week have heard from some fantastic leaders in the industry that uh, you know, doing what they can to stamp out bad actors because it's for the benefit of everybody that um, the industry is uh, as clean as possible. And, and I think we'll get on to later some of the fantastic opportunities that blockchain presents with some of the emerging issues with AI, et cetera. Um, so, so we'll cover um, issues around scams and darknet activity, um, cover some frustrations and roadblocks for recovering assets, risks around the future development of blockchain and as I say, the, the opportunities that blockchain presents to counter some of this activity. So in terms of dark net, that's something not that I don't come across in, in our role. Um, our role is more commercial disputes and fraud activity. Um, so dark net sounds pretty scary, Graham. Um, and I just, I can't believe that the biggest dark net um, site was called Hydra, which I understand was about 80% of market share and that's now been busted. And uh, now there's a, a fight for market share of um, the other dark net sites. Is, is that something you come across regularly in your line of work? Yeah, I mean, certainly reaching back to my experience in law enforcement, um, I'd say, um, you know, obviously law enforcement have been really effective at leveraging blockchain analytics um, to identify offenders, right? Offenders, suspects, um, you can use whichever language you prefer. Um, and obviously the ability to track and trace them through blockchain, identify criminal actors um, or suspects, if you prefer that particular term. Um, oftentimes in my experience, it's actually easier to do that in a cryptocurrency landscape than it is a, a traditional financial system. Um, I think that in terms of the um, one of one marketplace dropping down and uh, the sort of scrambling for for users. It's something we see all the all the time, you know. And to some extent, I know that um, a lot of my law enforcement colleagues in the world would be familiar with this using these types of phrases. Like it's a little bit like whack a mole, right? You, you sort of knock one off and another one stands up. But that being said, I think that if you look at the trends over time. Um, yeah, it's easy to lose hope if you say, oh, it's whack-a-mole, one, one goes down, more come up. But I think if you look at the fact that, for example, um, in the 2022 report, uh, darknet market funds have almost halved from sort of 3.1 billion the year before to 1.5 billion US dollars in 2022, that is a direct demonstration of the impact that law enforcement have had. Um, you know, the impact of making offending in that space um, too risky for offenders. You know, it, it, they're developing maturity in that space with investigation capacity, um, and they continue to grow that maturity. So, as that maturity continues to develop, as they continue to have more wins, if you want to look at it that way, they make that crime too risky for offenders, and offenders will move away from it. And we see that in the numbers. You know, the fact of the matter is that that significant drop in darknet market volume and and value is directly correlated to the fact that law enforcement have continued to develop their skill sets and take down those marketplaces and they are having an impact. Graeme, are there any, um, any examples that you can um, provide? I understand the sensitive issues of how the blockchain has assisted uh, law enforcement agencies. Yeah, I mean, I won't give any specifics. Um, <laughs> because it wouldn't really matter which side of the house I was talking from, my experience in law enforcement or, uh, or, or in my current role, there's a little bit of um, privacy around those things. However, um, I can certainly in general terms, yeah. I mean, um, the fact of the matter is that um, law enforcement around the world and even within Australia, um, they, they use blockchain analytics tools to track and trace flow of funds. That's that's fundamentally what goes on. Um, my personal experience in investigating darknet markets um, primarily involves some degree of online covert engagement. I don't think that's a, a secret at this point in time. We've all read about these things in the news. Um, 
you know, certainly that was my area of expertise, going online, becoming part of these communities, um, engaging directly with the with the sellers or engaging directly with the administrators or whomever else. Um, and from there, identifying little pieces of the puzzle that you can start to put together. Um, you know, there's been a range of different ways that that's happened. Everything from something as simple as track and tracing a, a particular transaction, following it through to an exchange, obtaining through law enforcement process, know your customer information from the exchange and identifying the offender, all the way through to some more complicated techniques um, that involve things like um, getting a lead, let's say, in relation to a particular service provider um, and doing some far more detailed analysis to identify who's paying for that particular virtual private server on which that particular service is being hosted. Um, you know, the opportunities there are only bounded by the imagination of the investigator largely. Um, and yeah, like I said, it definitely has a global impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's throughout Europol, throughout the United States, but also throughout Australia, um, the various states here are doing fantastic work. Um, and I can think of cases that I've seen in the last few months um, from different law enforcement agencies in Australia that, you know, are fantastic work. And when they come out in the media, I think everyone will be really proud of the work our law enforcement does. Is, um, given that blockchain is obviously an international um, tool, if you like, would, would you say it's possibly facilitating international law enforcement agencies to come together to work on projects? Yeah, it's... Um... It definitely is one of those things where uh, international cooperation is is a substantial piece, particularly when you're looking at darknet markets. Um, you know, you're talking about uh, participants in those markets that are located in vast geographies all over the world, um, and both the cryptocurrency element of it and the darknet market aspect of it means that we're talking about global platforms. They're not centered around traditional state boundaries or geographies. Um, and so that requires law enforcement to work together. Um, mm. And I think there's a number of different groups that have sort of enabled that law enforcement cooperation. Um, you know, in Australia, we, we have a fantastic working relationship, generally speaking, between state police and our federal police counterparts. The Australian Federal Police has an extensive liaison network all over the world. Um, and that can facilitate communication into jurisdictions where state police wouldn't otherwise have any reach. Um, as we move into more modern times, you know, I can think of a case just very recently in the last couple of months um, where I was reached out to by a colleague from a law enforcement agency here in Australia. Uh, they were looking for a point of contact in a particular jurisdiction in Africa. Um, I didn't have one personally, but I could reach out to a colleague of mine who'd been to that particular country and delivered in face training not two months earlier. He was able to provide me with a couple of names and a couple of email addresses of individuals within the law enforcement in that particular jurisdiction. We could pass that off and facilitate the communication, knowing that both people have done the same training, they're both speaking the same vocabulary, they both understand the investigations, they understand the nuances of cryptocurrency, um, and they can speak at level with each other and, and get the job done. And it was a very successful outcome for that agency. Excellent. Um, so we have to keep tracking on because of limited time. Um, in terms of scams, uh, I'd like to first highlight that victims need to act quickly. Um, so uh, on chain analysis stats, 75% of scammers cash out at exchanges. And you know we know the exchange and, and only a small percentage actually cash out at um, low KYC exchanges. So that people's identities are known. Um, now I know many many people that have been scammed. They they can they they feel embarrassed, etc. But you know, if if anyone's listening today, or people have got family members or friends that have been victims of scams, that they that they the scammers do use sophisticated techniques. Um, they're psycho psychologically based. I, I, I cannot believe the patience of some of the scammers and, you know, they can spend six to 12 months grooming somebody before they gently start um, tickling people's wallets and, and it's done in a, in a very um, passive kind of way. Um, Graham, what, what are some of the common types of scams that you've come across? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, personally, particularly when I was working at cybercrime, you know, um, we would see a lot of scam behaviour. If you look at the report from the ACSC, so the Australian Cyber Security Centre, um, that they issued last year, you'd see that, um, you know, they're talking about a scam or, or a cyber crime occurring around about once every seven minutes or so in Australia. Um, and if you look at the breakdown of those, when you start to delve into the different categories into which those things are broken down, the broad term that we would use as scam or fraud largely will fit the overwhelming majority of those offences. Um, the only thing that's really changed in, in recent years is the movement towards um, the use of cryptocurrency within that scam landscape. Um, so, but the common scams in Australia really are like in terms of the big ones, you know, we talk about things like impersonation scams, investment scams, NFT scams and romance scams. But in Australia, the big ones that are impacting our people are primarily the investment scams and romance scams. Um, they're the ones for which Australians are more likely to be victims. Yeah, so for, for people listening, it's it's not, but they, these scam, obviously the scammers know who's who has money and who doesn't in terms of demographics. And you know, it could be somebody within your family. It could be just a random uh, wrong message, text or WhatsApp. And then an elderly person might start a dialogue. Um, and then six months, nine months later, this now friend that they have, starts talking about investment opportunities that their family are involved in and it's not there's no there's no offer there's no push to have the person involved um that they know how to prick people's interest and get them excited and you know put people basically end up putting the money in themselves of their own fruition but but it, it, it's uh i don't i don't want to say what it's called because <laughs> it's a pretty horrible term but um yeah they're extraordinary the way that they happen and um we we need to i guess you know th those that do understand need to educate families and friends of how these things come about um so wrong mess wrong number messages uh, are dangerous Obviously, with investments, promises of large and, and quick returns, guaranteed returns, people offering extravagant gifts, um, we've come across um, you know some invest investor gurus that their their website looks like you're dealing with JB Weir or Goldman Sachs, but the whole thing is just a scam. Um, so so. But the, but the, I guess the trigger for that type of thing is the quick profits or the guaranteed profits, no risk. Um, and, and then I'm, I'm sure you'll find, Graham, often you know, pe people think they're on a good thing. It's, they're, they're built up to be a bit like a pyramid type. But then when people want to cash out, they ask for more money to enable the cash out. So that's an absolute... <laughs> You know, if, if someone hasn't worked out already that it's a scam, once you're being asked for more money to be able to cash out, that's um, that's time to call it quits. And also, it's very important to report these things to the authorities. So whilst the authorities might be overrun with um, or under-resourced in terms of dealing with things, if, if people look up Operation Deadbolt, which was up, um, by the Dutch police, where uh, they, it was a ransomware type attack that they worked out what was going on and they were able to look at databases of other enforcement agencies throughout Europe and put together a, a, um, an action plan for all the people that had registered the, the issue. Um, do, do you know much about that one, Graham? Uh, look, I, only, I haven't had any personal um, dealings with that particular case. Um, you know, I've, I read about it in the media, obviously, um, you know, it was, a, it was a fantastic effort by the Dutch National Police there. Um, you know, their high-tech crime unit is uh, is quite well regarded in most jurisdictions, I think. Um, you know, I've had the good fortune to work with some of them in the past. I've got some good friends that I could think of in that unit. Um, and I'm not at all surprised by their expertise that was brought to bear there. Um, it's a truly amazing story, the way they're able to, um, to leverage that uh, unique facet of being able to um, essentially scam the scammers if you want to put it that way in that really yeah. simple language yeah. um, it's always exciting to see the police have a big win like that mm. yeah 
So in terms of um, chasing funds and asset recovery, what, what kind of frustrations do you come across that you know, roadblocks that the industry itself might put up or, or issues around regulation? Yeah, I think probably um, one of the big ones, in a, again, in a local jurisdiction context, in my experience in law enforcement, has been, it's been great frustration over the years, um, you know, with, within the state police, certainly with the differing legislations, you know, uh, there's no national consistency to legislation around seizures. Um, and I think every state would, would ideally love to see some more support from government in relation to, um, you know, some new legislation in that space. Legislation takes time because it needs to be gotten right and there's always a balance to be had. Um, and we totally understand that. But I think it's fair to say that for investigators on the ground, it's very frustrating to be dealing face to face with those victims who've had those tremendous losses to see the funds right there and to know they're within your grasp. Um, but in some cases, not be able to do, to do much about it because of a lack of authority to seize. Um, and, you know, consistency of those authorities or the inconsistency of that makes it really difficult for people like exchanges, you know, exchanges and other industry partners within our ecosystem are doing everything they can. But I personally think it's it's probably a little bit difficult for them to be expected to unilaterally make these decisions to seize without some form of power to, uh, you know, provide from a law enforcement perspective some form of documentation to validate that particular seizure. It sort of places a great onerous on them. Um, and I think there's some support that can be had there from government. Um, there's certainly willingness on the part of the exchanges to be active participants in this. Certainly all the exchanges I've ever dealt with have been, uh, particularly in Australia where they're you know registered with Austrac and having financial service licenses and those sorts of things. You know, they are active and willing to participate. They're very, very willing to help within the bounds of the law. But what they need is that strong regulatory framework to assist them, to allow that data sharing, to allow those seizures to take place um, and consistency of that around the country to make it a lot easier for them to implement those programs to assist victims. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's on, you know, that need is in hyperdrive now because I, as people in the industry say that it, the legislation is still playing catch up, but now with AI um, and the ability uh, for people to get around KYC using AI and deep fakes, uh, increasing use cases for cryptocurrencies, which provides further off-ramp opportunities for fraudsters. Uh, there's there's so much happening, and yet the legislation is still too it's just too slow because these these new facets of the developing technology are going to create even more problems for us to deal with without the legislation. At the same time, the, the blockchain with its permanent, um, immutable, et cetera, fingerprint um, will, will provide um, opportunities. It, it, it does provide a, a real solution to um, deal with some of these issues that are, are coming at us. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. You know, um, uh, the transparency of our blockchain technology is our greatest asset. Um, you know, it enables us to have so many opportunities we haven't had before with, you know, pre-withdrawal screening and transaction monitoring and those pieces. It's a great opportunity for us. Um, we just need to have, you know, we need to be able to take full advantage of that. Yeah. And, and I guess some, um, you know, I find people are often surprised that, um, the work that, that we do in little old Melbourne town and, and the reports we produce, um, it, it, you know, as, as we've said previously, the, the, the blockchain and authorities are working together internationally, even though obviously laws don't work across um, borders, the, the work that's done does. So our, our reports have been used internationally to uh, obtain subpoenas, um, for exchanges to provide the identity of uh, fraudsters. Um, so are there any, we've only got a couple of minutes left, Graham, any, any other tips and uh, words of wisdom for people that might be victims of scams? No, I think the main thing is to come forward and report. Don't be embarrassed. Um, you know, it happens to a lot of Australians and the more information we have around those scams, the more we can act, you know, by coming forward and reporting as quickly as possible, as you said, um, you know, we can engage the services through Report Cyber, which will engage the law enforcement aspect. 
Um, I think law enforcement are growing their relationship with private sector. And I think those private public partnerships along with the regulatory changes will really enhance our response to scams in the future. Um, you know, I look forward to those opportunities coming to fruition. And, you know, as I said, I think the main thing is, you know, don't be afraid of reporting it and, you know, reach out to your family and friends and communicate and talk to them, you know, reach out to those people in your family who, who might have a better understanding of these things and maybe can give you some advice um, rather than perhaps going to like social media for advice. Yeah, and, and that's, a, I guess, another thing, I guess, that the um, authorities and legislators legisl legisl need to deal with. Um, I saw a recent survey that 30, was, I've got written down here, 34% of Gen Z are using TikTok for financial advice, 33% YouTube and 24% um, mainstream financial advisors. So... That's that's yet another thing that um, people in Canberra need to be deeply considering is um, the digitization of everything. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, you know, we've got great resources with Scamwatch and others, um, and I'd always encourage people to have a look at those. Um, there's also non-government bodies like ID Care out there that are helping people as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a challenge moving forward. Well, th thanks, Graeme. Thanks, uh, Blockchain Australia. We're, we're wrapping up here in terms of ghosts and uh, tracing people on the dark web. Um, no, it's been wonderful. And look, there was a comment um, in the chat that there is a show. Um, I'm actually pretty sure lots of people are aware of it, but for those who aren't, Tinder, Tinder Swindler on Netflix, yes. a pretty good example of a romance scam. And... It, look, it, the fact that there is there's a lot of uh, podcasts and shows that are coming out that are showcasing some of these scams, um, and I think it's it's a, it's because it's so common now that people can relate and people know that this is an ongoing issue. It is dramatized a lot, but the fact that it's it's out there now is is a pretty good sign. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us, guys. It's It's been an absolute pleasure. I've been wanting to do this session for a long time and I hope that you two get together and do some sort of podcast so that we can dive deeper and deeper and deeper into some of these stories. Graham, I know you've got some and Mark, I've heard yours already. So if we can, if you guys want to get together, just um, even just for my own entertainment, uh, that'll be great. So thanks for jumping on Blockchain Week 2023. Thanks, Rose. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Bye.